Um, Tom is not going to be here this morning. He's taking his dad to uh, some kind of an appointment. So I will um, invite us to open with prayer. and We can jump into Exodus with both feet. God, we just thank you that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us and that although we often struggle to understand, we're grateful that you want us to understand and that you work with us and that our duty, our, our input to this is surrender and openness. And so we ask that you would help us, that you would guide us, that you would be present at this table as we study your word. Um, and we thank you for the time we have and the blessing that we have in doing this. Amen. All right. So we'll start in Exodus, obviously. Um, we started, I actually started the messages in um, verse 6 of chapter 8, Exodus chapter 8. But I'm going to go back and read starting at verse 1, only because that's kind of the... Um, Kind of the logical beginning of the story. And this is not the first plague. Uh, we understand that. So there's been there's been a plague before. Um, and so the plague of frogs comes seven days after the previous plague passed. And then verse 1 of chapter 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will plague your whole country with frogs. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people, and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will go up on you and your people and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same things by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. We'll stop there, and I just want to say this. Why on earth would they want more frogs? And how do they know? And how do they know who made the frogs? Didn't really think about that. They're overrun with frogs, and the and I, I mean I can see myself. I, you know, so you're there with Aaron and Moses. Clearly have this power, and there's this part of me that wonders. You know, these these quote unquote magicians for Pharaoh. Did they just claim the frogs? Like, hey, we made those. Were they a different color, a different species? I know it sounds silly, but um, at the same time, it kind of doesn't make sense. If I'm Pharaoh, and, and, and this is, you know, we, we look for uh, support for our position. So, so Aaron and Moses, Moses have at, made this request that, we, that you leave the, the, um, the confines of Egypt and go, go to worship God. But Pharaoh is the center of worship in Egypt for all of the people. So this is a direct challenge to the character of, of, of Pharaoh. One would think that perhaps you would try to one up, like okay, so if 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 Aaron and Moses brought forth frogs, and Pharaoh's magicians wanted to prove that Pharaoh was an equal to God, like I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna equal you in this. How would they produce more frogs? Why would they not eliminate the frogs that were there? Why would they not eradicate the plague that's already happened in order to prove? Uh, you know that that their that their magic arts are as powerful as Aaron's, and 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 then, you know the the answer biblically consistently is because what Pharaoh's magicians were able to do was what God now allowed them to do. They all they could do is produce more of the frogs. They couldn't undo, and they couldn't do something different. Um, you would think that Pharaoh would have pulled them aside and said, guys, what's going on here? We didn't need more frogs. <laughs> I ask you to do something. I ask you to step in here. Show me that we have supernatural power that can equal this. And, and they don't. But we don't know if that conversation happened or not. We have no idea what really happens behind the scenes. Because what we, what we have is what God wants us um, to know from this. Um, my, my, a note in my Bible says that the magicians can only add to the distress. 
Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got too many frogs. We can make more. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and it, and it's kind of one of those. It's it's kind of one of those. You know, it's like a. You said, she said, he said, she said. Like, so we can make frogs too, but that's not a solution. It's just it, it is because although Satan has real power, it's only the power to corrupt. Satan cannot bring anything good to pass. Satan can make us believe that it's good. We can be deceived in, uh, you know, and, and human history has shown that we are outstanding mental gymnasts and we will, we will contort anything and everything that we possibly can to make it appear that we're in control of our lives in the world around us. Um, and so, hey, we can make frogs too. Seems like an easy bet. I'm guessing Again, if I was thinking about what we know about people in, in the halls of power. So his magicians, these guys had to be nearby. And you can imagine that, that they would be scheming which one of us is going to be the head magician. You know, we, because you want to stay on Pharaoh's good side. You, you certainly don't want, to, you don't want to be on his bad side. So if any of them could have gotten rid of the frogs, if any one of the magicians would have been able to say, hey, I can make them go away. They'd have done that, <laughs> and they just said, "You know, I'm the top dog. I'm the I'm the magician you want, Pharaoh." Um, but they couldn't. They, all they could do is throw out the, do a, a little bit more of the same. They could increase the sorrow, which, you know, part of the theme of the plagues is precisely that. That the longer Pharaoh resists God's will, the greater the burden on the people. The greater the burden, that, so the the plagues are escalating, and uh, and remember, you know, remember where this starts. Um, if you would like to, um, let's see. Let's see where I want to start. <clears throat> um, let's go back to chapter 4 of Exodus. Just real quick, we'll jump in there. Um, <clears throat> actually, no, I'm sorry. Let's go back to chapter 3. Um, we want to know... This is the beginning of Moses' calling, but we did say we would be spreading out a little bit. And the important piece, we'll start at verse um, 7. Now, this is after G Moses has seen the burning bush. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, and this is the key piece, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So it's a pretty clear calling. God's in charge, and the point of this is to come and worship God. And it's important that we recognize that because the deliverance too often we look for an opportunity to find freedom, to, for God to intervene, for, for ourselves to be set free. And certainly the Exodus experience is central to the identity of the Jews for all of their history. I mean, you can't, you can't uh, separate the notion of the Exodus from the identity of being, uh, of being a, a Jew. And so there's, and there's the, the traditional back and forth where Moses says, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the guy. But the key here is the object of worship. And the reason it matters is because there are two, there are two truths for humanity. We're the only thing that needs to choose to worship God. 
all that God has created is a witness to his to his creative power and, and the beauty and the majesty um, and all that he has. So it's easy to see that God is worthy of worship, but we have to choose to worship. We have to choose to 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 worship God. And and there's a very uh, key reason for that. In Kings, it tells us we, we read something that is obviously true, um, that we become like the thing that we worship. And so what is our goal? We're created in God's image. We have sinned. And what we need to recover is not perfect behavior, but an understanding of who we truly are. <laughs> an understanding uh, that our identity is, is uh, apart from everything else in the world, our identity is, is grounded in there's a part of God imprinted on us. Um, and so worship is the way that, that we understand how we travel back to that, how we re reclaim that experience. And so if, if I'm worshiping something else, it's, I'm becoming like that other thing. And this is the challenge. And this is the reason that the Israelites can't, or not, maybe not the reason, a reason they can't worship in Egypt is because there's only one that you can worship. You couldn't secretly worship God. You worship Pharaoh. That's the only one. And worship was done in a lot of different ways. But it wasn't, it wasn't possible in that context for them to be going through the motions and, and, and worshiping God. So there are people without worship. And they need to be separated from that so that they can, uh, so they can worship God and, and, and honor him. But is the point to worship or is it to actually escape to go to the land? Because that's confusing to me. At the beginning, he says, just three days, we'll be back. But wasn't the whole goal really to exodus fully? Yes. Exit fully? Yes. The, yeah, there's... Is it true that they were really going to go for three days? Um, <laughs> you know what? That's a good question. We, answer, we, can't, say that? we can't know that for sure. Um, I, I think it's, yes, there's, there, are, there are two things operating. The big picture, the plan that God has is to lead them into a land flowing with milk and honey. Um, whether that plan could have been accomplished with the Israelites going out for three days to worship God, and maybe that had Pharaoh allowed it, maybe that three days would have been enough for them to get their act together, I develop an identity as a people, and then exit the land in a more order, orderly fashion. You know, they didn't get that. What, what, what happens is when they come out of Egypt, unfortunately, is, again, because of that drive to worship, and Moses is up on a mountain getting the information from God that he needs to get, the people decide to worship, and they worship what they know. And they worship the golden calf, and they make the, gold, the idols. So there is this, this need for us to worship, and for the right object of worship to be in front of us is still a part of it. Had they been able to come out for three days and gone back, maybe they would have been able to avoid, uh, you know, the, the events on on Mount Sinai. But but in all of it, God has a plan and a big and a sense of the big picture. So God isn't twisting Pharaoh to say no. God's taken Pharaoh's heart, which is hard, and said, I'm I'm going to, you know, God isn't condemning Pharaoh. Pharaoh's condemning himself and Egypt. But God's simply pointing out. You're not going to win against me. It doesn't. It doesn't matter how many times you think I'm going to give up. You know, I I will ultimately. God is going to win that challenge, and the Israelites need to see that, and the Egyptians Egyptians need to see that. So the truth. You're right, Lynn. The truth. They didn't get that three day option. Would would that have worked if it had been option a, a possibility? Yes, I guess we have to say. But the point is, the, the point is less about whether it's three days. Three days, I, I take anyway, to be the minimum amount of time to get the Israelites all out of Egypt and then back into Egypt. It's a fairly, fairly large number of people. It's a fairly big movement. So it's kind of like it takes three days to go to church if you're bringing 400,000 people. <laughs> I, guess, I guess it kind of makes sense. Um, but they never got, they, they, didn't, they were never let go. Is it possible? That Pharaoh could have worked out a, a a deal with God if he was trying to be obedient and said, you know, yes, it's there's always the possible possibility of repentance. It, God is not willing that anyone should suffer. When when the Israelites finally are let out of Egypt, any Egyptian that was willing to put the blood on the doorpost and and observe the Passover was welcome to be a part of it. 
So, so in, in Pharaoh's hardened heart, God is not taking a good person and making them bad. God is not multiplying and, or misleading Pharaoh and, and the people. They're choosing not to, to identify and to recognize uh, that God is, is who God is. Um, and for that, they pay a price. Um, but when Pharaoh's heart is hardened, it's kind of like we all can do this, right? If I'm holding onto a string, a rope, and Jeff's got the other other end of it, if I'm not pulling real hard, Jeff doesn't pull real hard. But if I start pulling a bit hard, Jeff starts pulling a bit hard. We keep pulling, pulling, pulling. Then I let go of it, and Jeff falls on his can. Did I push him on his can? No. But did I escalate the consequence by pulling harder on the rope? Yes. And that's that's what we see with Pharaoh and the ongoing plagues that that God is highlighting. You know, and then then right after that, right after Jeff and I do that tug of war, and I let go of the rope, and Jeff falls on his can, I say, Now, do you understand what it means to resist me? <laughs> and 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 then Jeff is supposed to go. I do. I'm sorry. I'll from now on do everything you say and never argue about it. Of course, we know that Jeff doesn't have that in him. <laughs> nor do nor am I worthy of it. <laughs> We're both grateful that that didn't happen. But that's the idea of multiplying it. Is it it brings the illustration of power to a place that makes sense. This is Pharaoh's got to put the entire country at risk. I like I like I like to look at things a little bit backwards, but. Looking at this from Pharaoh's perspective, he huh? was—he grew up thinking he was God. He is God, and all the people around him his whole life think he's God. Yeah. And so now these slaves rise up and say, "No, our God's better than you." And you know, so he's, <laughs> he's doing what he is born to do. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, I remember I was watching a science fiction movie. I can't remember the name of it, but this guy who was a god just like that, I and mean, he was—he was dying. And he asks this other guy, he says, well, what's going to happen to me? And he goes, well, that's just between you and your God. Oh, wait, that's you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and, well, but, yeah. So, you know, well, and <clears throat> but but I, but there is a there is a truth. And this is why our the witness to who God is has to be less about what we do and how you live. You know, the, the law is not given. For salvation, the law is given as a recognition of who God is, and and a, and a way to worship. Again, a way to worship. Um, but yeah, I mean, think about it. He's Pharaoh only knows, and he, and he has magicians who can do some magical things. And what does it mean to be a god? It means that people listen to what you say, do what you tell them to do, and worship you by giving you all the gifts that they possibly can, and treating you as if you're more important than everybody else. And that's been his experience. That's been his immersion. Of course, there's the it's a catch-22. Is it possible that somebody else would have been born into a Pharaoh's line and said, I'm not God? Well, it's possible. And, but they would have walked away and not, and not stepped into that role. So, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it, God does not take us any place that we're not willing to go. You know, we have, we have the example of Cain and Abel. Uh, you know, Cain and Abel come on the scene, and, and Abel is a little bit more pensive, and Cain's a little bit more... And impulsive, and Abel comes up with a way to thank God, and God's honored by it. Cain comes up with a last-minute gift that he got at Dollar General in Egypt, and and God says, you know, that's not the same. It didn't come from the same place. And so Cain decides that the the solution is not to find the right way to worship God, but to get rid of Abel. So instead of instead of seeking what's best, Cain decides to get rid of what is better. And it's critical that we recognize this human tendency because we all have it. But God says to Cain, I know what you're thinking. And be aware, sin is crouching at your door. If you let it in, it will master you. But don't. So Cain has this teaching moment. And I, you know, we have we have these stories. We don't have to have more than one story, Cain and Abel's story lets us see how God is dealing with us. It's a paradigm for how God deals with all of us. We're given the opportunity to obey. We're given the question, you know what's right, you know what's wrong, don't choose what's wrong. And we fail. We continue to stumble. And as that happens, Cain says, oh my gosh, I'm going to be all alone. And God says, well, I'm not going to let them, I am not going to let your life fall apart completely because of this decision. And that's I think the beginning of grace 
think that's where we begin to see that God's God is showing as as a true loving parent would. It does not want suffering to be endless. It does not want suffering to be um, unbearable. It doesn't want to have to have Cain eliminated. Uh, so we don't we don't have that conversation with Pharaoh and Pharaoh's um, uh, magicians. But we don't need to have that recounted because God's already shown us this example. This is the way God deals with us on a regular basis. And you know, I, I and Jeff probably has heard this from prison as well. But I've I, I've had the opportunity to to listen to many people who have been on what we would all consider the wrong side of the the lawyer's bench, and and every I everyone nearly everyone I know. Um, is capable of saying, I've heard this many times, I had a conscience, I just chose not to follow it. Mm -hmm. The notion of what's right and wrong mm -hmm. isn't what we lose. It's the will to choose the better or the right. Even, even sociopaths intellectually understand what they're doing is wrong. They're simply choosing to do it because it benefits them. And there's no, there's no remorse. No, it isn't a failure to identify what's wrong. It's a lack of desire to do what's right. And 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 we are we are all aware of what the right thing is. We have the ability to ask that question. We have the ability to look inside and say, what's the right thing? But we also need to recognize that like with Cain, like with Pharaoh, God isn't going to force us into the right decision. He wants to lead us into it. And that's what happens with, you know, if Pharaoh doesn't get it, and, and he never will. Actually, none of them got it. Uh, the Hebrews didn't get it either. And right. so this was a tremendous change for everybody. <clears throat> uh, nobody knew what was really going on, uh, except there was something really big here. And Pharaoh kept saying he knew what he should do, but yeah. he went the other way. Yeah. And at the end, when the, when the Hebrews did leave, did the Egyptians say, oh, this is a real God, we ought to worship him? No, they just kept on with the way they were. And, and the, even the Hebrews, all these miracles, and we think, why didn't they get it through their heads here? But hmm. it was, you know, t time after time and thing after thing, and they went back to the, they were so entrenched in their old ways, they just couldn't seem to part with it. Yeah. My Bible says, I don't know about the first two plagues, but the rest of them did not happen where the Hebrews were living. Now that had to be stunning. Yeah. They have these conversations like, oh, it's not happening out here in Goshen. What's happened? You got frogs? You got, you got <laughs> right. You no, know, it's not. I mean, they didn't. Did they not have those conversations? They probably didn't talk to each other a lot because it, of the level of cat class that they were. But and and that's very convicting to me. I, and and the you know I I think part of what from from the human perspective, it it is a, it is a grand thing to under to try to imagine that these plagues are happening. That there's a God, we, it, we could forgive the Hebrews, the, the Israelites, we could forgive the Hebrews if they questioned whether God cared. After being in captivity for generation after generation after generation, it's certainly, you could understand that some of them might say, what do you mean that God is going like, to, the God you're talking about hasn't done anything good for us since my granddaddy was around. You know, my granddaddy had to make bricks and his daddy before him had to make bricks and I'm making bricks and my kids are going to make bricks. You can talk to me all you want to about how this God you're talking about is going to save us from Pharaoh. But all I can tell you is I've been making bricks and everybody I know that's ever been doing this is making bricks. So it might look to you like God's blessing us in the land of Goshen. But history has shown me that might not be repeatable. And, and that's a challenge. Uh, that's the step of faith. Is it... You know, is it believable? And so there's the, you know, God works this out so that there's a progressive unveiling of God's ability to deliver and willingness to deliver. Um, but even though the, the Israelites, even though they were in that situation, they were still crying out to God for deliverance. Yes. So that's what the, the very first thing you said. This whole thing is an orchestration of an answer to prayer. Yes. I mean, however long it took, however long it took, yeah. the Israelites had been praying for this. Yep. And yeah. this is how God answers. It's not just a, you know, I'm going to beam you over to the land of right. the honey. 
Yeah. I'm answering your prayer. I have heard your cry. Yeah, that's a really good point. It is a response to their cry. It, it's not a. It's not God manipulating world powers. It, it's God listening to their cry, and 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 how it is for all of us when we come before God with a prayer. Sometimes you know we 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 say tongue in cheek. Be careful what you pray for, but we only say that tongue in cheek because if we say it with a sober mind, we realize that's a powerful statement. It is a, that is a, is a powerful statement. Um, My Bible suggests it was maybe over a year, and you think like how awful COVID was. Like these people, it's humorous now, but it'd be like, I wonder if we're done with it. And you're like, oh my gosh, yeah. in a week or two, or a month or two, another thing. Right. Your livestock dies, you know. That, you know, that, that's a good point. We, I guess, I don't know how long. In in the movie, it makes it seem like it was so quick. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Huh. Right. It looked like it was the week. Mm -hmm. day after day after day type of yeah. thing. Yeah. Like, movie. It's right. And and that's that's a good point because I think it, at least in our culture today we've lost the sense of that kind of grand timing. I mean, it's not hard for us to believe that the movie could be done in two hours and reflect kind. Of, I mean, we're we're because of the ability to communicate and to and to move around. You know, we can we can do we can accomplish so much in so little time that those those grand um, swipes of time, like how long does it take for? All of the frogs across all of the land, and you know, and and yeah, these are these are really broad brushstrokes, and 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 we, I, I think we probably don't can't really comprehend the magnitude uh, of, of what this is. Oh, we've become so uh, accustomed to things being instant that we can't comprehend, you know, things elapsing yeah. over time. You know, like <laughs> right. Yeah, it's it the the. The the notion of long suffering is one that I think is hard, at least for me to to me long suffering is is more than two day delivery. That's right. <laughs> what do you mean I can't have it in two days? That's what, we're indignant that it might take a week to get it. Um, so so we have this this prayer for deliverance and deliverance. And I think, you know, the, the, the uh, comparison I tried to draw last, uh, yesterday was uh, between our a cowardly response to God's work and a courageous response. And I, I, it does take courage to follow this lead. This is bucking the trend. The Israelites were numerous, but they weren't a majority yet. And they certainly didn't have the ruling power. And they and they were not really there were no um, there were no officials. Even Moses's attempt to kind of stand up as a Hebrew and and say, you know, you, you shouldn't treat each other this way. Moses is on the inside of the of the palace. You know, he's got he's got some uh, you know recognition in in Egypt, but even 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 Moses that they're skeptical about. Um, and so the 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 courage that it takes to listen. And to respond to this is it's dramatic. It, these are not easy, and it's and it's easy to give in to the fear um, of of the unknown. Well, following up a little bit with what Gene was talking about, and it ties in with what you're saying because they, they really had to do that. But the you know I was looking up the words in the Hebrew from when he hardened his heart. You know that's always a big thing. Who hardened whose heart? Right. But that's the same word that's used later on in, in the Exodus when he calls them a stiff-necked people. Yeah. So they go from this, oh, we believe, we believe, and then all of a sudden, yeah. well, why did you lead us here? What, what's, yeah. <laughs> why did you do this? To yes. Yeah, and the key, and, but the thing is, we haven't changed. Yeah. <laughs> we're the same now as we were then. Oh, yeah. We, you yeah. know, it's just, <laughs> yeah. God right. made us this way. <laughs> and, 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 and this is, this is why grace becomes so important because it's you know for those who would suggest that the that the bible is just a book that was written by a bunch of people who wanted to design a religion that's only by people who've never read it because this is not a this is not a document that is very um complimentary toward us as a people <laughs> it really it really does not outline uh, you know a, a pretty picture this is not an enticement to be a, a person of faith. This is not an, it, it, there's a lot of 
confusion and stumbling and falling down and forgiving and not forgiving and, and you know and, and God leads us and then we don't follow and then we go a place we're not supposed to. I mean, this is real. This is true. The, this is the the reality of what it's like when human beings try to figure out how we're going to share power with the God that created us. And we aren't powerless. We 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 would like to surrender and say, oh, it's all up to you, God. But we at least have the ability to choose. And so so we do have some some skin in the game, and and it's not easy. You know, it's not easy to 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 listen for what God wants and find the courage to to do what we believe we're called to do. And I think that there's a lot more um, there's a lot more space in the response zone than what we maybe realize. That, that um, any other comments before we read a little bit into the actual text from yesterday? Even though they have prayed for deliverance, this is along the line of their years and mm -hmm. long prayer. They have prayed for deliverance, but God mm -hmm. is going to give them so much more. Yeah, He's going to mm -hmm. give them a land of milk and honey. Right, and that's not what they prayed for. They just wanted to get out of Egypt. And, yeah, you know, so that's sort of. Yes, and, and and God, you know, orchestrates the the called plundering the Egyptians, but they're not just leaving; they're leaving with all of the gold and silver and mm -hmm. things of value. Like they're they're taking a ransom with them, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so they're, they're not just getting out in the dead of night without without being caught. They're taking all this valuable stuff with them because it's because God says they can. You know, they're 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 and they get halfway there and they say, oh, you know what? I could really go for a hamburger. <laughs> back in it, back in Egypt, we had hamburgers. There was McDonald's in Egypt. There is no McDonald's out here. We're just eating. You know what's go, what's up with this? And it's I I love that image because that's us. It's so thoroughly human to get a little bit along the way and then go. Oh, I could use a hamburger, especially when you're wandering around the wilderness for forty years. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that, that, <laughs> well, yeah, they started complaining right after they got across the Red Sea, and then it didn't get better for them. No. Well, they started complaining before. Yeah, they weren't supposed before. to take 40. <laughs> right. No, was their, that was the part of their, because they lacked the, their fear was the thing. And then I thought, when I read the Old Testament, there they were out in the wilderness, and they're going to do this tabernacle. Where did they get all that stuff to build it? Yards and yards of blue cloth and scarlet cloth and... Yeah. And gold mm. and stuff. So they had mm -hmm. to tote it out from Egypt. Yeah. And somehow it was it was there when they needed it. And it, it is. It's always there when we need it. And we just would like to know, be sure it's gonna be there when we need We want it ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> we want we want to have the confirmed delivery. And then the the, the Jewish people were the ones sent to the promised land. Well, of course Israel still is the promised land for the Jews. And the only way they got them back there was the Second World War and the mm -hmm. persecution that they went through in Europe. Mm -hmm. And you would have thought, boy, we can't wait to get back to to get to Israel. And yet they did. A lot of them did, but a lot of them didn't. Yeah. Um, Lynn, you mentioned this. I want to go jump ahead on ch in chapter 8 to verse 22, where it mentions the land of Goshen. Um, and then read a little bit past that. But... On that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. This miraculous sign will occur tomorrow. And the Lord did this. Dense swarm of swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's palace and into the house. This is when I'm out, just so you know. The swarms of flies did me in. I'm now going to, if I'm Pharaoh, that's it. I'm not going past because I think they're all biting flies, like you find on Lake Superior. And if they're black biting fr flies, I my entire family ran away into the van and closed the doors and let me to be eaten alive while I took down camp. <laughs> they bit through my flyproof clothing. These flies bit me through pants, just so you know. So I'm out with the flies. So anyway, dense swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's palace and into the houses of his officials. And throughout Egypt, the land was ruined by the flies. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, go sacrifice to your God here in the land. But Pharaoh's trying to negotiate. Moses said, that would not be right. The sacrifices, and it's an interesting twist. It's absolutely true. The sacrifices we offer the Lord our God would be detestable to the Egyptians. 
And if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in their eyes, will they not stone us? We must take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God as he commands us. And and it it, it is a both and. God's commanding it, but also if we did it here, it's going to really tick off the, the people who are here. Mm-hmm. And then Pharaoh says this, I will let you go to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God in the desert, but you must not go very far. Now pray for me. His last words to him, now pray for me. As soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord. And tomorrow the flies will leave Pharaoh and his officials and his people. Only be sure that Pharaoh does not act deceitfully again by not letting the people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Here is, again, how often God gives us a chance. Pharaoh says, I've had enough. So right now, Pharaoh's just like me at Lake Superior. I'm done with the flies. I'm out of it. You, you get me out of the flies, and I will do everything you want from here on out. And although God knows that Pharaoh is not going to hold true to that, he answers that prayer. He answers, he does, he gives relief from the flies. Even though, even though Pharaoh's pledge to be obedient and to let the people go. And this isn't letting them go out of the country. Again, this is letting them go just outside the, the border of Egypt so they can have a festival and come back. So this isn't really, uh, you know, God has not yet said, we're going to let them go and they're going to stay away. It's, okay, I'll let them go for three days. I promise, I'll let them go for three days. God knows that Pharaoh is not going to do that. And yet he answers that prayer. He, Pharaoh asks for Moses to pray. And Moses does. And and the the plague of the flies is lifted, and they don't let the people go. So the worship service doesn't go on, and so the so the the plagues escalate, and the pain escalates, and the and the tension builds. Um, um, <clears throat> the sad thing is that supposedly, if you, I guess based on their ages, they grew up together. Yeah. And it's just so strange how, and families are like that now, too. It, it is the, um, it, and, I, and I, this this sounds over, over, oversimplified, and it's very simple. I think it's accurate, not oversimplified, but uh, nothing has really changed in the, in the human heart. Our temptation in Eden was to take over the role of God and be God ourselves. To take the fruit that would that would make us eat. That was the temptation. Not that we were hungry, that that looked like a better fruit than any other fruit. We'll call it an apple because that's what everybody else calls it, but we don't know that. Mm-hmm. But the temptation was not for that particular fruit. The temptation was that that fruit would make you like God. And and this is what this is where Moses and Pharaoh, who grew up together, this is the separation. Moses is saying, "I don't want to be like God. I met the guy. I am. I, am not, I know that I'm not God." <laughs> Moses had that. He's like, "Listen, if that's what it means to be God, I'm out." But he but he has had this experience that that God has placed in front of him these miracles. Pharaoh also sees these miracles, they're bigger. Moses gets one burning bush. Pharaoh gets the entire country. But the difference is that Moses is able to recognize that God is who God is. And Pharaoh is still tempted to say, I'll let God be God and I'll be one too. See, we don't, we don't, our yearning to be, um, our desire to be God is not, I don't think fundamentally to be the only God but to be just our own personal God. I don't think we want responsibility for feeding all the rest of the people. I don't think that we, when we try to take away, we try to take control, take charge and run the world, what Pharaoh's doing, um, I don't think that we're really ever thinking that we're going to have the kind of responsibility for taking care of the world that God truly has. I think it's really just, we want to run our little piece of the universe. But but it hasn't changed since Eden. It It has not changed. The temptation is to be God and call the shots. Moses has become, and I, I, I can't over, I, I can't emphasize too much the the character quality of humility, both from the perspective of Scripture and from the perspective of human relations and and leadership and effectiveness. Humility, which is 
I, I, the way I define it, which I think makes, um, at least from a biblical perspective, um, the decision to use resources that are at your disposal to benefit another ahead of yourself. It doesn't mean that you take yourself out of the equation. It means that you put others ahead of yourself. You take the resources that you have. And that's exactly what Moses gets and exactly what Pharaoh doesn't get. Moses understands he has very few resources. He's, he's given Aaron and a stick. <laughs> that's about it. And Aaron's holding a stick. <laughs> You know, so so and, and and Moses has not been given by God this grand. You know, God doesn't say, "Okay, here's the deal, Moses. There's going to be ten of these plagues, so hang in there." It's like day to day. Moses is getting just enough information to take the next step, but in faith, he takes that information that's been given to him, and and easily, if if we had a, um, you know, he's like Dudley Do Right. Moses is, but if we had a if we had a villain getting this information, he could have gone to to Pharaoh and said, "Listen, here's what this guy says." Now I'll tell you what I won't. Right now he's saying I need to call out the plague. So if you'll set me and my guy Aaron up, if you'll give us a palace of our own, if you'll let us, you know, have all this wealth and everything, I won't tell God about this. I won't call down the plagues, and you might be okay. <laughs> Easily, you could see how how the information that Moses is being given. Could be used in in a way to to try to blackmail or to coerce um, the leadership, but Moses doesn't do that. He takes the information, the resources that are given to him by God, and he applies them to benefit the people, you know, the the big picture ahead of everybody else. And we know this, we see this come together at, at Sinai when when he's up on the mountain and comes down. They've been you know created the golden calf and everything else, and he smashes the tablets, but he comes back to God and he says, "Listen, don't kill them all." Don't kill them all because what will that say about who you are as a God? See, well, Moses is still taking himself out of the, the, the primary picture. And so when it says that, that Moses is the most humble man in, in all the earth, there's a reason that we're, that we're told that. He is an outstanding um, example of, of humility and leadership. Well, I'd like to dash everybody's picture of who Moses was. All right. Mm -hmm. We all see Moses as Charlton Heston, the 33 years old in the movie. Oh, he's 80. But it, he's 80 years old. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> he's not that guy. <laughs> he's not that guy. They never you know, <laughs> depict people. Yeah, they oh, they right. show all the disciples as being 80 years old, and they didn't live that long as a role. Right. So. <laughs> oh. And why didn't Pharaoh just have Moses eliminated early in the game? If Moses was was saying this is going to happen, all he, Pharaoh had to do, and he would have uh, his own people and any Israelite that got in his way, he would have had, he would have killed them, mm -hmm. had them killed. Mm -hmm. And there's no, this does not cross Pharaoh's mind, which reminds me of Job. God told Satan he could go so far and no further. Mm -hmm. and, he, and, and if it does, if it did cross Pharaoh's mind, it's irrelevant because God's not going to let it happen. And Moses doesn't lose heart, and Moses does have the courage to move forward, and that's and that's it. The, it is the courage to trust everything God's asking Moses to do. For any thinking person, like you said, Gene, it would be easy to say, "Listen, I'm I'm one guy. I've got Aaron, and he's got a stick. That's it. Yeah. How are we going to defend ourselves if Pharaoh decides he? Not even Pharaoh. You know, Moses goes into the palace and says. My God says, let us go, or this is going to happen, and then it happens. The magicians are going to say, you want to, you want to, you want to fix the problem? Get rid of Moses and Aaron. It doesn't, it doesn't even need to be Pharaoh to get, getting rid of them. You know, they're, they're in a very public place doing these things, and nobody's happy with them. And, and so from a courageous perspective, Aaron and Moses continue to do what God calls them to do, even though they have every reason to believe that it could be the last thing they do. There's no reason to believe that that Pharaoh is going to listen to them, and and there's no good, there's no positive outcome at the end game. Not that they can imagine. They couldn't have imagined. I mean, even as big as the plague of flood, the the blood in the ri of in the Nile River, or even even the the um, angel of death. You know, plagues were fairly common back then. A, a whole bunch of people dying quickly of something that they couldn't understand is not out of the out of the realm of possibility. 
But the notion that they would be crossing the Red Sea on dry land, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, <laughs> this, is, you know, this is a deliverance that they could never imagine. Um, and so in, in their prayer, in their conversation with God, um, there is this, this ongoing. And, and what God didn't do is say to Moses, listen, at the end of all of this, you guys are going to leave and you're going to get to the side of the Red Sea. Trust me, I'll part it then. You can get across to, to Sinai, so be ready for that. Moses gets a day at a time, <clears throat> one day at a time. He's not, he's not told how the whole thing's going to work out. And I'm convinced that's because if he'd have heard that, he'd have run away screaming. God had never gotten anybody to do it if they knew the whole picture. You know, it's like Moses is like, okay, this is all I can take. I, I'll, I'll handle this one thing and and move on. But he did have the encounter with God, a very personal, powerful yeah. encounter with God at the burning bush. Yes. Mm. You can't underestimate that. That's right. He saw God. Yeah. And he. That's right. And and he held on to that truth in the face of everything else. His experience. And this is. I I I've repeated this, but it, I'm not the author of it, and it was probably um, centuries previously. But the statement has been made frequently that if you have had a, an experience with the living God, you have an argument that can't be refuted. You have a position of truth that can't be denied if you have had an encounter and experience with the living God. And in that, that case in Moses, and in, in case of our, uh, our salvation, giving our lives to Christ, when God has, has become a real presence in our world, even for a moment, knowing that reality of God, that, that, that you know, flash in the pan of the burning bush is something that for Moses cemented his understanding of, of who God was. And, and, mm -hmm you know, continued him through all, all of that time. That's real. <laughs> yeah. Um, where we are time-wise? A few more minutes. 15 minutes? 10 minutes. Sorry to those of you who are on Facebook. Tom's not here, so if you've been writing in comments, which I haven't seen, then so far not any. Um, <clears throat> any other questions? Uh, then what I'd like to do is let's go to Ezra. I just touched on that briefly um, mm -hmm. Sunday, and I really like this passage. And it's not one that really gets um, talked about or preached about very often. Um, but we can. This is another one of those. Um, it's at the end of the historical book, so after Second Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah. They're not very long. Um, but you know, I'm gonna. I'm going to prevail on you, Melanie. Would you give us a, a four-second, four-minute um, description of what is happening as Israel is going back in historically? Uh, oh, uh, well, you had Cyrus that was decreeing um, that the, the the Israelites could return to their homeland and rebuild their temple, and yeah, not all of them went. I mean, a lot of them stayed in Persia. Yeah. Um, they, they, they got accustomed to that lifestyle yeah. and uh, accustomed to the people, but a lot of them, a lot of them did go back and rebuilt the the, uh, the second temple. Yeah, yeah. So and we stood until 70 A.D. Yeah. So so this is a major event in the history of of Israel, and and it's and it's precipitated. Cyrus was not a, a Hebrew, Precip precipitated by a Persian king, and probably precipitated because the king thought. You know that city's just in ruins. If I can get them to rebuild it, yeah, you know, why not? Kind of like a timeshare. And Persia was uh, up until about a hundred years ago was known as Persia. Now it's Iran. Yeah. How uh, ironic is this? Yeah. Right. Right. We're not talking about uh, like friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so so Ezra and Nehemiah are accounts of what's happening around this time. But th there's a there's a long journey that's going to be necessary. There's going to be some sacrifice and some time. But the idea is that for for the Israelites, we have to remember the promise of that land flowing with milk and honey, the promise of a homeland, of the place that is their land. That's that's huge. The the land on which Israel as a nation lives is central to their identity from the beginning of uh, Moses, uh, from Abraham's time on, and so th that the idea of returning from this captivity. And, and, you know, kind of restarting in Jerusalem. And all of the materials are going to be built. 
on, provided that they yeah, can Cyrus they can, gave it, them the, all the materials to rebuild the temple. So there's 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 all of this going on, um, and so we'll just stop for one second in Ezra chapter four. There are some naysayers. The enemies of Judah and Benjamin, two small tribes, heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel. They came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the families and said, let us help you build because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Asherdan, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the, and the rest of the heads of the family said, you have no part with us in building this. So, so we get the typical infighting. It's going to be consistent. Um, but then I want to go on to, um, let's see. Chapter 8, starting at verse 15. Um, I assembled them at the canal that flows toward Ahava. That, that word means beloved. And we camped there three days. When I checked among the people and the priests, I found no Levites there. So I summoned Eleazar, Ariel, Shamamiah, Elnath, Elnathan, Jarib, El, El Nathan II, I guess, Nathan, Zechariah, and Mahushalam, who were leaders, and Jorib and El Nathan, there's a lot of El Nathans in there, I haven't read this list in a long time, who were men of learning. And I sent them to Edo, the leader in Casaphia. I told them to do what Edo and his kinsmen, the temple servants in Casaphia, so that they might bring attendance to us for the house of our God. Because the gracious hand of our God was on us, they brought us Sherebiah, a capable man from the descendants of, Maha, of Mali, son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebiah's sons and brothers. 18 men, and so anyway, 220 of the temple servants, verse 20. Then verse 21, there by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed the fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from elements on the road. Now, see, they're traveling a long distance with a lot of valuable goods. They're, they're carrying hugely valuable goods into Jerusalem. The raw materials for rebuilding the temple didn't exist there. So they're going to be traveling. They say they... I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had told the king the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. In other words, they said to the, to the army, we don't need you. Now, this wasn't a foolish move. It was recognition of the reality of their circumstance. We're taking valuable stuff through the wilderness and we're going to be targets. And, you know, so so it doesn't it, it this is not blind obedience. This is a recognized, okay, we're going to put ourselves in a situation that could be in danger. However, they give God a chance to speak. They stop the activity. They gather, they fast. They turn themselves they they turn their hearts toward God and seek God's approval. They don't just, in a, in a wanton way, say, no, nah, God's got us covered. They want to know for sure before they undertake this and, and turn down the soldiers completely. He, they at least want to be able to say, we've prayed and God says, yes, we need the soldiers. But instead of just listening and saying, yes, we'll take that, that, um, take that escort, they say, listen, our, what you're doing, Cyrus, is in response to our God's plan. This isn't your idea. This is a fulfillment of our God's plan. And because it's a fulfillment of our God's plan, you've provided this peace, which we're grateful for. That's all we need. God's going to get us there safely. And to me, that's a, a, a really powerful and important recognition of when I, we talk about prayer being, God, show me my part and remind me of your part. This is what's happening right here by the Ahava Canal. Show me my part. This list of all of these names, these are the people who were invited to come back and said, yes, I'll go. It's not a list of everybody. It's a list of those people who responded, those people who, for whatever reason, heard God say, this is your part, to go back to Jerusalem and be part of rebuilding the temple. And when you get those folks together, 
before they take off, when they've got the materials and everything together, they stop and say, God, what is your part in this too? Here's our part. We're here. We're ready to go. Show us, remind us of who you are. Remind us that you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remind us that you've called us to rebuild this city, which is your temple, which is your house. Remind us that you're using the king of Persia to provide these goods. Remind us that your word is still true. So there's this, this really powerful, of, you know, we recognize our part. We're going to go back and rebuild it. Remind us of your part. And God says, yes, I will protect you. And so they, they, they refuse the armed escort because they, they have had the chance to ask God and they gave God a day to answer, which it, it's I, I don't I don't want to over um, taking time to fast is an important way that we uh, that we set aside ourselves for God to speak. It doesn't have to be a whole day necessarily. It can be a meal. It can be a day, um, but the intentional seeking for God to say, confirm, lead, guide, something like that. Um, and giving God time to answer um, is is as much about settling the troops as it is about getting God to speak. It's God doesn't have to wait to make up his mind. It's just, you know, this this time of fasting, this this pause is for us to stop being fidgetal, fidgeting and and distracted. It's, you know, God God knows exactly what to show us. We just have to be in a place of listening. Um, so anyway, that's. Just a chunk inside there. We're getting close enough now that I need to say. Any other questions or comments? Thank you to all of you for joining us. Mel, would you close us with prayer since you have been a sidekick already? <laughs> <laughs> Lord, uh, th thank you for uh, this group to gather together here and, and listen to your word and study your word, Lord. And and we ask you to lead us and guide us and and. Uh, just show us a path, Lord, and, and give us wisdom and insight as we uh, go into this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all. I'll sign off. You ready for Sunday? Sunday. 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 Uh, What's that? Oh, yes, yes.